we haven't actually met in person yet, but we spend a lot of time talking online, uh, email, uh, Twitter, of course. So I'm very excited to be here talking with you today. Likewise. Uh, kind of have to kind of lay the foundation for me because anytime you ask uh, me what my favorite API is, it's Twitter. Twitter is the most important API on the planet, in my opinion. It's the one that I love the most. It's the one I've used the most. And But I have to put it, also say it's the one that I, that's upset me the most uh, when it comes to APIs. Because And it's not always Twitter's fault. It's what we do with the ecosystem does with it sometimes upsets me. Um, and then 2012, 13-ish, I would say as a, as, a, as a platform, Twitter didn't always make some of the right decisions and I didn't feel like it was in alignment with me as a consumer. And I was a very vocal power consumer, probably a pain in the people's ass at that moment in time. But starting in the last three or four years, that's changed. I've started to feel like, once again, the, the design of the API reflects my needs and not just me, I'm saying me as a community. Um, it is all about me too, but is, it just seems like there's more alignment there between how you are building the API and designing the API. And, and it just feels like we're all moving forward in the same general direction, which is really hard with a massive developer ecosystem. I know it's very difficult. So I've seen certain hints over the last year that are the positive signs. One of them is an open API. But I've also seen very transparent uh, engagement with the community when it comes to the the whole V2, the whole V2, and and then what you're the next wave of APIs you're building. So, right. can you share with us a little bit? That was a long way to get here. Can you share with us a little bit what has been your approach to V2? What changed? What's different? Absolutely. So first of all, thank you uh, for having me. Thank you for uh, starting to listen, and thank you for you know the truth, sometimes kind, sometimes less kind words. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm Daniele uh, Hehem. I'm heading developer advocacy and community for uh, the Twitter developer ecosystem. So I work at Twitter, and I work with the Twitter API. Um, what changed? Um, we were in a position, historically, if actually, show of hands, have you ever used the Twitter API before 2018, two, three, okay, that that's right. They weren't open to everybody. The Twitter ecosystem was completely closed, and historically we catered. So we very we started, I think, ten years ago with this very public open API, beautiful, uh, free to use, and start we started to see a lot of excitement. And then what happened? Then we started to follow our competitors too closely, and they started to make more money than we did. And we thought that everything we touched should make money. And that was around 2014, 2015. Um, so they decided to shut down the developer ecosystem to purchase a company that created this enterprise-grade API for uh, big companies. And those companies would have access for a huge amount of money to all the tweets, all the public tweets. That was called the Firehose. It was around 2015. And that's where things started to go not as good for pretty much everybody. Um, Twitter thought that was great for Twitter because we would make some money out of the API, which was great. But then millions of developers out there that would basically not bring the creative energies that really created Twitter. If you think of um, the image upload service, that was actually a developer who built that in the first place and we acquired them. If you think of the hashtag, that was created by the community. It wasn't created by us. Our first iOS app was actually built by a developer. We acquired that. TweetDeck, another app. So this innovation stopped in 2015. And um, we made some money for a certain amount of time at the expense of the rest of the ecosystem. And at some point, we realized that, yeah, that gets you that far, but then when it comes to the future of Twitter as a service, 
this creativity, we need that. And we need developers to contribute to that. We are a very small but mighty company with a huge roadmap. We'll never get to the end of that roadmap. So developers can come in, step in, and bridge the gaps that we'll never uh, bridge ourselves. And so in 20, yeah, I think it was being, uh, the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, we started working on the new developer platform. And it was designed to be open and uh, more transparent, even in the decision-making process. So we knew that in order to resume the trust that we broke with developers, we had to start doing one thing, listen. And that's what happened. So we started to, you know, come back very gently, apologize, tell them we made a mistake. And from now on, we're going to not tell you what we're going to do, but we're going to show you what we did as a result of listening to you. And that was the journey we started. Um, so that was the first part of what you were alluding to. And I'll stop here because it's already a lot. There's still a business model in there too. It's actually a well thought out, Yep. next generation kind of v2 business model right yes like in so one of the things that one of the pleasures of working at a company like twitter is that you really can be as open as transparent as you can and that's exactly the thing like the, the first question um everybody should ask when when building with an api is why is this company building this api for and the, the answer is, sometimes you think, oh, because it's cool, or maybe because they had engineer, engineers to spare. No, companies build APIs to further their company, for their company goals. In 2015, for Twitter, was revenue. In 2012, was to have creativity. In 2022, is to have creativity again. We are at a point, and you probably noticed this from the news, in which we are changing a lot, and we might change a lot. We're, going, we're still going to be a very small company and we're still going to have a huge roadmap. And if we allow developers to really have a say in uh, the algorithm, isn't this a way to actually open source the algorithm? So there's a precise business model there when it comes to creativity. And the new Twitter developer platform um, allows you to do that. One thing we released two weeks ago is uh, the reverse chronological timeline API. And we marketed and we built it in a way so that developers could really uh, put users, people on Twitter in control of what they see. Um, the API, if, you're, if you haven't built recently, the V2 API, we run machine learning on our own tweets and then the results we expose it through the API itself. So for example, if you want to exclude tweets about politics, you can just request the uh, annotation for each tweet. One of the annotations could be politics. And if you notice that, you can just remove that from the timeline. And that's one thing of you know, creating your own algorithm. You still have all the tweets there. The, those are available to you. And if you put that into, the, into your own app or experience, there you are, like an, an alternative timeline, an, algorit an algorithm that's open source. So those are the things that we are uh, keep listening to, um, not just from a business perspective, but to enable developers to really have a say in the tour of the future. One thing that happened uh, last summer was with Spaces, for example, and um, that's really the prime example of how we built these things in the open with developers by choosing really, I don't know, somebody uh, I think uh, not in this session said um, developer first. So we put developers first. When we build an API, like I said before, one of the things we ask ourselves is, you know, why, why do we build this API for? And we know our internal answer is to, you know, further our goals, like I said. Why should developers care about, you know, our goals? What's in, what's in store for them? And that's the story we need to tell. Sometimes we know they want to make more money. They want to build an innovative app. They want to differentiate themselves from the competition. But what if you have uh, something like Spaces, which is new for everybody? It's new, it's new for Twitter. It's new for the ecosystem of social media. And it's new for developers and users. Like, where do you find this answer? And we look at uh, developers and we listen to them. 
So that, I mean, that alignment between a platform and its community is really difficult to do. And in the API world, we use the word API governance a lot. And governance, the word beyond the API realm, you think about how it works. And one of the way that democracy and, and these feedback loops with government can work is you have these town hall meetings. You ever been to the state of Maine? They actually still hold their their uh, elections this way. They have these town halls. You come, they're usually in churches or schools, and you go in and you crowd in, and you actually make your voice heard. And so when it comes to API ecosystem governance and actually finding alignment with your constituents, your consumers, your, your developers, there's a lot, in my experience in the, in the Twitter ecosystem, there's a lot of developers first and foremost. Then there's a, a small slice that's really loud and likes to complain and be really noisy. How do you, I was really fascinated by how you, you use Twitter spaces to develop yes. the Twitter spaces API. Yeah. So as a feedback loop with your, your ecosystem and community, can you share how you, how you did this? Exactly. So um, last summer, like I was uh, saying, uh, we decided to uh, build an API for spaces. Mind you, like live audio was and still is this new frontier. Like it's not podcasts. It's not radio. It's on social media. Where do we take this? The answer internally is we don't know. Like nobody knows, just like nobody knew, I don't know, 30, 35 years ago what to do with the actual internet. Um, or what to do with Twitter in 2008. Or, like what, what exactly. is Twitter going to yeah. be? I would have never guessed yeah. what it turned into. Yes, I remember even to, to give a little bit of uh, context and background, like when Netscape, the browser was out, there was this, for, for the Zoomers in the room, 30 years ago there was this company called Netscape. It was the Google Chrome of 30 years ago. And it was this browser and it was new and nobody knew what to do with this browser or, and, and the, or with the internet in general. This was before social media, apps, iPhones and all this kind of stuff. And so Netscape was like, maybe we just sell the browser and this is how the internet makes money. And they ended up like failing. Um, one thing that survived the Netscape was um, developers. Uh, because Netscape, the only thing they could foresee was this, you know, putting putting software, their browser in an actual box and then shipping it, just like it was a product. And they failed because of that. They couldn't see e-commerce, they couldn't see social media, they couldn't see iPhone apps, they couldn't see JavaScript, they couldn't see anything. They invented JavaScript and they couldn't see, you know, that thing. Developers came in, developers built e-commerces, developers built Twitters. The, or social media and these kind of things. So we adopted the same approach internally. We don't know, but developers might. And so we're, we're, how do we get developers to tell us what they want? And so we started with a very clear blank slate and we tried something that was, you know, to me completely crazy. Um, we started to run spaces about the Spaces API. We went out. We started a space very randomly. We told them, please join. We have something to tell you and something for which we need your input. And uh, I, yeah, I, I run those spaces. It was the first broadcast. And I remember saying, like, look, here's the idea. Everybody's interested in uh, social audio. We don't know why you should care. Can you please tell us? And developers tuned in and actually told us. The great thing about this communication was really the town hall effect. You know, we could have run this in Maine, probably. Uh, in, an interesting conversation as well. But we didn't know the motivation for developers. We knew that, you know, creators were out there and were interested. That was the only thing we knew. We know that users were interested in discovering new content, but we didn't know why developers should care. And developers told us, we care because it's uh, new. We care because we already understand some of the dynamics happening in the creator ecosystem, and you are not fast enough in uh, building those yourself. So if you build an API for that, I'm going to build an app that can uh, help you with discovering. 
uh, and we can also build apps uh, that can help creators understand how they're performing. And that was the very first. We repeated that each week, while at the same time we were building our product requirements. So at where we build, um, we start with the product requirements document, where we basically state who are our customers. We have this jobs to be done approach. So we treat people as our customers. They enter into the shop and they hire us for something. Um, and so we basically need to understand who are our customers, so our developers, and what is the job to be done. We didn't know what the job to be done was, like what, what, develop, what developers wanted to do with an API. And they told us, so they basically told us those two things. We want to help people discover things they like in the moment as they happen, because spaces are live and ephemeral. And the second is we want to help creators have a better conversation with their sponsors or partners so they can tell those partners, look, this is my uh, listenership, this, this is my content, this is how the, the affinity between the content I push and my listeners, this is my growth, would you like to sponsor my, my spaces? Um, so in order to do that, developers told us we need metadata uh, about people who speak, people who listen, and um, other things like the topics and the content of the space and the tweets being shared. Um, I was like, I was also the interim PM for Spaces at the time, for the Spaces API. And so I was like, this is, thank you. Like you're basically making my job much easier. And we kept having that conversation over time. And um, we started to really define the functionality. And then we switched to uh, the design. Do you want to know how? Well, yeah, I wanna, so, how do you make this more real as part of the design yep. process? You've got the requirements, you've got the jobs to be done, yep. it, the feedback loops in place. How do you make this tangible so that, that you can actually start building right. it? So the, the beauty of uh, space is that it's really unstructured and it's a conversation, but you can't share things. And even if you do that in tweet form, you can't really explain an API or design an API with a tweet. Um, so, like you mentioned, uh, since the release of the V2 Twitter API, now we have and maintain an open API spec. Actually, if you go on api.twitter.com slash two slash openapi.json, you can actually download it right now um, or import it into Postman, which is what I personally do, um, and then run a mock server from there. Perfect. Um, yeah, what we did was basically uh, build an open API spec directly for uh, the design, the intended design of the endpoints. That was, oh my God, like, beautiful. When the magic happened right there. Um, we shared this with developers. We, we put uh, that spec out and um, we discussed that in a space. So we pointed developers to the open API spec. We walked developers through. Uh, we generated static documentation from the spec and we gave them, because it was a weekly kind of series of spaces, we gave them a week or so to re review that. And um, some of them told us, please make this change, please name this field. Um, others told us, we really love this endpoint, please you know, keep doing that even for other parts of your platform, if it, even if it's not spaces. Um, and um, the unthinkable at that point even happened. Uh, there was one or two weeks before we were about to finish up like development on the, on the endpoint. So the design was pretty much validated from our previous conversations. We put that in writing in the open API spec and we give people two weeks to really tell us, yes, this is exactly what we talked about. We released the endpoints and 24 hours after the, um, the release of the endpoints, we already see apps being built. They had the contract. They like, knew what the interface Exactly. Would be. And so somebody, without telling us, created um, a mock server to run, to start building the integration. And then when we released the endpoints, uh, they switched to production like this. And it took them 24 hours. That was the fastest launch we recorded in, at least like in the four years I've been, almost four years I've been with Twitter. Well, wow. I mean, so I don't know if you can like think about the the scope of this. You're not just yeah. 
defining the Twitter Spaces API, you're iteratively redefining audio in a social, like the next generation. You said this isn't a podcast. Yeah. This isn't radio. This isn't everything that came before it. You're taking that that resource audio and then making it and taking your native social, but then you're using the same practices to, to build the feedback loop, have these town halls and iterate on that, make it tangible with a contract. And then that contract, because everyone's in agreement along the way, they're able to start building even before you're finished building it. Yeah. And now we're doing this for pretty much everything. So every time there's a new endpoint or a new product, and we're, we're, we're blending on those things. We repeat the same process all over. Um, we, when we worked on the reverse cron, which we released a couple, uh, again, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we built the same uh, open API spec with you know, being as truthful as possible as the design we wanted to pursue. And they, the developers gave us feedback. So for reverse cron, there were things that we needed to go back to the drawing board and we did. And that's how we show developers that we are listening. And that's how we can finally change the perspective of uh, the tour developer platform. It's not just a fire hose that's available to the top 50 biggest companies in the world. It's for everybody. And you can start building like, right now. If you go on Tidoco, let's sign up, for example, you can start right now. It's not like the past that you can, um, you needed to get the developer account approved, approved, it would take two weeks to get rejected, everybody will get rejected, like what was the point? Um, so yeah, and we're doing this for, uh, like I said, reverse cron, um, the timelines, uh, experiences are going to be um, the next thing and we already run the spec there with uh, a smaller group of people were uh, involved early in the process and all the new things that are going to come out. Uh, there's going to be the, a real-time API we're working on. There's group DMs that had the same open API spec treatment. So the moment you connect with Twitter Dev and you see a space, it's going to be either a town hall, either a way for us to reach out, or there's a product discussion going on. And you can actually shape the platform and the product, like you said. Like As a developer, you're not just... Um, uh, thinking, how can I help this company make more money or make, get more users? But it's more like, as a developer, how can I get something out of this collaboration with Twitter? We don't say build with us, build on us. We say build with us. We build these things together, and we are trying to be as open as possible as we can. And like, um, there, are, there are things that even I couldn't think I could say, and I can. And we're trying to be really as you know transparent uh, as possible. Have this glass walls between us and the outside world. Well, the when you first came to me and shared that you were using Twitter Spaces to to build the Twitter Spaces API, I was like, oh, Meta, that's really you know that's interesting. <laughs> and then I started thinking about, I was like, well, bringing together developers in an audio space to build an API, like, how do you make that stick? How do you make that tangible, real? But the the mocking the contract the open api contract as that contract between twitter and the ecosystem mm -hmm. the ability to iterate on that mock that is really the foundation of that trust building exercise and but i feel like twitter spaces now is is the perfect environment because we're human creatures like i've been trying to understand collaboration between developers producers and consumers for a while and it's hard to get people to collaborate. You, you say, oh, put them in Slack, that's great. But then this other team uses Microsoft Teams. Right. Or, you know, this is audio, we're human beings. And, but having that contract really allows us to kind of make that, codify that into something that we agree. And then everyone can start using and applying. But that trust is important, uh, super important. Yeah, that's the, like, this is also what makes events like this great because you, you have all, always the pulse of, you know, how, how human the connection is. Um, in, in terms of friction, also it gives you um, for existing endpoints or for functionality you want to, uh, to build, it really gives you a sense of how frustrated people can be. And that frustration as a, you know, in developer relation is really an asset you can use. The, so if, you, if, you, if you do a job like ours, basically, 
the beauty of the job is that you get to be a developer yourself, you interact with other developers, and you have the power to get product to make better decisions based on what you hear. How do you do that? Sometimes it's like feeling based. I want to have a delightful experience with, uh, with an endpoint or with a developer product. And if this makes me like table flip uh, every time I, I use it, then maybe we can do better as a company. So when developers tell us over space with their tone of voice, oh, I hate this because I'm trying so hard to find, to understand what is the topic of this space and I don't have it. And I see that in the app, you actually have a label with the actual topic. Can you just add it? Like, I mean, you had the data there. Why can't you just expose it? And I was like, you're right. And so at that point, we had another product manager for spaces, which was great. Um, and I went and I just had to, you know, get the sound bite from the space and tell them, can you hear the frustration? It's like, yeah. Can't you, can't you just prioritize? What is the level of effort here? It's pretty low, so just do it. And the person did it because of that. Yeah, what a great feedback loop. How much, how long should I keep going? I can talk to Daniele all afternoon, so. Cut it off, are we done? <laughs> yeah, all right. I mean, that, that just blows my mind, like what's possible. I really look forward to being part of iterating these, these town halls and iterating the, the, the every new API, but also iterating on the existing ones. Yeah, if you want to join one, just you know, uh, let, let us know. I will, and we've been experimenting as Postman using Twitter Spaces as far as how, how, the, how it works as a medium, so you can tune in to what we're doing there as well. But thank you, this makes me feel so much better. I mean, seriously, it's my favorite API. It's the most beloved one in my stack, so thank you for all the work that you've been doing. Thank, thank you, thank you for using us. Thank, thank you for you know, hosting us and uh, giving us the inspiration to get closer to developers with tools like Postman, absolutely. And I'll, I'll be around for networking as well if you want to ask questions or uh, you know, get deeper into these kind of topics. Thank you. Thank you.